to be invited. We are recording. I was really excited. Wow. I was really excited to be invited to take part in this studio social series, um, specifically because it, it, the idea is to focus in on one artwork, one recent artwork. I'm not sure whether this can be described as recent, but it is um, just one artwork I'm going to be talking about. Um, and the fact that Natalie uh, likes to work with artists, as she said, who focus on the idea of place or place-based artworks um, responding to the climate emergency. So this is exactly what I aim to do with the 2016 project, the, the Glasgow Effect, and the it's the subsequent book that was inspired by it. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. But it's very specific to Glasgow as a place, its history and its social economic problems. But I hope the project and the book do raise themes and ideas that people can relate to wherever you happen to be. Um, and actually, just before I get started, I'm quite interested to know where people are. Um, if you wouldn't mind a little bit of um, participation in the chat, it'd be interesting to know where people are calling in from. I can recognise a few names, actually. Um, a few people who I know have got there and quite a few people are down in Felix, so that would be interesting to know. And I know there's people on the call who have read the book, but this is not necessary because I'm going to be doing a bit of an introduction um, to, to the main themes. Great, people all over. Deniston and Glasgow, so am I. <laughs> Stockport, um, Loch Winner, Felix, so London, Bury St Edmunds, Preston, Salford, Jorlands. Very exciting, we've got a real mixture there. So anyway, hopefully you'll all be able to, to take something from this. Um, so yeah, I am in my studio in the East End of Glasgow at the moment. And I've been based in Glasgow since 2008 when I moved here to do a master's in fine art at Glasgow School of Art. And it's that experience of moving here as an outsider somebody who'd grown up in, in London and then, and then um, studied in Nottingham, which inspired me to attempt to do the Glasgow Effect project in 2016. And at that point, I had been living in the city for about seven and a half years, but I'd never quite felt at home. So the project attempted to address that. It was based on this very simple premise that I was going to refuse to leave Glasgow city limits for the whole of 2016 and, and not use any vehicles except for my bike. So it was what I saw as a sort of real life experiment in thinking globally and acting locally, which was a phrase I'd, I'd uh, borrowed from the great Scottish thinker, Patrick Geddes, who coined that in 1915. It was an attempt for me to slash my own carbon footprint for transport to zero. and to experiment with living what I describe as like a low carbon lifestyle of the future um, and to see what I could make happen in Glasgow if I invested all of my time and all my energy and, and all of my ideas in this city rather than continually traveling around for work which is what I found myself doing as I got older and, and a bit more successful as an artist there was more and more pull to travel so it was a simple idea but it did spark a bit of a controversy when I launched it in January 2016 um, and kicked off a bit of a social media shitstorm. Um, and people were really angry, well, and uh, uh, for lots of reasons, but firstly, because I'd been awarded a grant from Create Scotland, which is our Arts Council in Scotland, in order to undertake the project. Um, a grant of £15,000 for the year, which some people at the time, some of the more open-minded commentators saw it as a potential pilot for a sort of universal basic income. Um, but a lot of people were angry at the way I'd chosen to frame the project with this photo of the chip and using the phrase, the Glasgow effect. This is what really touched a nerve. Um, 
And the Glasgow Effect was a phrase that I'd, I discovered a few years before the project in the field of population health, which had been coined by population health experts to describe what was then an unsolved mystery as to why people died younger in Glasgow than in very similar post-industrial cities in England. And the main comparators are Manchester and Liverpool. So um, Glasgow has 30% 30 higher excess mortality than those English cities, despite the fact that they all have very similar levels of poverty and deprivation. And Glasgow has some of the worst inequalities in health in Western Europe. So I knew it was going to be a pro provocative title. Um, and I chose it so that this project that I was going to, to be doing was not going to be something that was just seen as another sort of middle class um, <laughs> environmental project about low carbon living. It was something that was going to address Glasgow's social problems head on and to start to make the connections between social, environmental and economic issues within our city and, 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 and wider. Um, and those are the connections that I try to draw to, to, together in the book and why I chose the subtitle, A Tale of Class, Capitalism and Carbon Footprint. That it's looking at the social, the economic and the environmental aspects together. Um, and specifically, I wanted to highlight thinking about mobility and travel the fact that it is the most privileged people in the world who are doing by far the most damage to our climate um, with the world's wealthiest 10% causing half of all emissions. Um, so much of the anger aimed at me during this time at the beginning of 2016, people were asking, why should I get paid not to leave Glasgow when there are so many people living in poverty in the city who never leave anyway? I think is a very valid, valid question. And Darren McGarvey, who you can see pictured in this clipping from the Daily Record, um, described what I was doing as a poverty safari, which he, a criticism which he later went on to develop into his own book called Poverty Safari, which is about his experience of, of growing up in Pollock, which is one of Glasgow's big post-war housing estates. So the book that I wrote, Darren's book came out in 2017, and the book that I wrote um, was really a response to Poverty Safari. Um, it was written a year, a year after Darren's book came out, um, and it offers a very different perspective on the city, kind of outsider's perspective on the city, but there are lots of parallels between the two books. They're both very personal, and very political narratives describing our different class backgrounds and how they shape our kind of uh, our thinking and our action in the world. And together, I don't know if anybody has read them both, but I think together they kind of provide quite interesting case studies for public health professionals potentially about what they describe as the social determinants of health. That is how the society that you grow up in affects your health outcomes. But my book is also a book about an artwork um, and all the multiple ways in which that artwork could be understood or interpreted. So in that respect, this was another one of my key inspirations, um, which is this series of books published by After All, which is an art publishing, um, it's, an art, it's an art magazine and publisher. And they do a series called One Work which kind of chimes with the studio socials ethos. Um, and that is, it's an entire book just about one artwork. Um, and this specific example is about a piece by the American conceptual artist called Lee Lozano, it's called Dropout Piece. Um, and she was a really key inspiration for me when I was devising the Glasgow Effect project. Um, so all of, the pro all of the books in this series are quite, ethic works. I mean, this one particularly, Lee Lozano declared in 1970 that she was going to drop out of the artwork and has never been seen since. That was the dropout piece. So uh, she is now dead, but it was a sort of 40 year 
performance where she just disappears. Um, but yeah, so I thought, well, nobody's going to write a book about the Glasgow effect. It's going into it in the detail that I would like it to be gone into, so I'd better write it myself. Um, so the structure of the book is it's in three parts. Um, and I think to understand the why, why I structured it like this, I think it's important to know a bit about the social media shitstorm that I experienced and the pressure that I was under to provide answers to all these critics online and to account for the public money that I'd been been awarded to do the project. So the book's basically that. It's everything you could possibly want to know <laughs> about why I did this project and much more. So part one, called A Beef History of Neo Neoliberalism, but it's basically explaining this kind of personal and political narrative, how I ended up in Glasgow, um, and all of the little details that influenced my decision to decide to do this Glasgow Effect project and just also to seek funding to do it. So I call that the complete context for my thinking and action. And then it gets into part two, which is about the project itself, the, the social media sitcom that kicked off and um, trying to interpret what, what some of this might mean and taking a closer look at the population health research around the Glasgow effect. And quite coincidentally, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health published a massive report behind me somewhere down there um, where they claim to have finally solved this mystery of, of why Glasgow had worse health outcomes so I kind of summarise that in the middle section and then in the third part go on to sort of outline what I call a manifesto for a sustainable city of the future so hoping to bring together or to present lots of solutions to all of the problems that are raised in the previous two parts of the book. So the book was re-released re last November um, to coincide with COP and I wrote a new foreword for the new edition and at the end of that kind of describe how, describe that it is a tale of both the effect that a place can have on you and in turn the effect that you can have on that place. Um, so I'm really looking at Glasgow and the impact that the city had on me and my own mental health and, and tracing back my relationship with the city, which goes back to my very first visit in 1988. So that's me on, on the right there um, in 1988 at the Glasgow Garden Festival. So I see this as quite symbolic for the story. Firstly, on a personal level, because it was the first time I ever went to Glasgow, but um, on a wider level, because the Glasgow Festival itself was the kind of symbolic start of Glasgow's reinvention of a global capital of culture. Um, and it was that reinvention as, an, as a creative city that really lured more middle class people like me to the city. I came here to go to the art school, but there's, there's the sales and others like me. Um, and, and it's us coming into the city that have arguably exacerbated inequalities um, between, the, between the, the, the native class regions. Um, so going back to the, to the kind of environmental impact of the, the action, this is the kind of central illustration of the book which I call the carbon graph for short, but it, it shows, well, this particular version has just, just been updated, uh, shows 18 years worth of carbon, my own carbon footprint for transport. So I wanted to, to do this very anal data analysis to be able to illustrate two things. One was this feeling that I had that my carbon footprint was increasing, as I described, as I was getting older and more successful. I was getting there was more pressure to travel and I, and as I moved further and further away from home I had to travel longer distances to go backwards and forwards to visit friends and relatives so that was one thing that I wanted to do illustrate and then obviously the impact of doing that project in 2016 that I didn't produce any carbon 
for my transport. And uh, I've updated it over the last couple of years because I wanted to show the full impact of the lockdown as well. And I think that's something we're going to discuss um, in a little bit. So you can see 2020 and 2021 on the end there are the, the two lowest years of carbon footprint after 2016. So quite a dramatic impact that that had. Um, so yeah, I've just got a few more slides. Um, and I think that this, this, this slide, you know, going back to Lee Lozano's um, dropout piece, I just started reading this, this, the introduction to this book this afternoon again to remind myself, but it's really talking about the project itself as an absence. It's the fact that she disappeared that is the artwork um, and and this 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 parallels in this as well because really the absence of carbon but was that was the out was my um end game in a way so the fact that there was no carbon producing no transport in my year was what I was hoping to achieve but of course that absence of carbon there was matched with a sort of an, an intensification of local activity um, and that was everything that I got up to on my bike and walking around the city. So I wore a little GPS tracking device for the whole of the year so I could track everywhere that I went. Um, I was particularly interested in, do that, in doing that to kind of have some sort of evidence of being in the city, but also because I'd created this absurd situation where um, the grant, you know, that I had to stay with it, the, the grant itself was dependent on me staying within those boundaries. So I was quite interested in that idea of like being tagged and, and watched and surveilled the whole time. Um, but this, this heat map, when I kind of looked at this data at the end of the year, and that shows every single place that I went, um, it was just really interesting to see where I had been because I was really just traveling around the city center within quite a small radius, this five kilometer radius. So this is my flat, this white dot in the West End, very uh, leafy, well-heeled West End. And then I'm cycling over here to the East End, which is where my studio is, and then in the city center and kind of all around. So, um, in, in, in drawing this map, I and marked on the big post-war housing estates that were built in Glasgow. Um, and what happened during that period was that so many people were moved out of the city centre. So lots of city centre accommodation was knocked down and people were displaced to these big housing estates really far out of the city centre and further afield into new towns across, across the um, the whole of the central belt. So that in, in itself created uh, a lot of spatial inequalities um, and the fact that people were so far away from the city centre, meaning that they couldn't really, it was much harder to get, get in and transport being a major issue and a major um, thing that I have focused on. Um, and in Glasgow Centre for Population and Health report from 2016, well, they described the reasons behind the Glasgow effect as, as being a very complex series of processes that have impacted on the city since the Second World War. But one of the key factors is the nature and scale of urban change in the post-war period and how that um, really, um, yeah, as I, as I said, caused a lot of spatial segregation um, and smashed up what were very tight knit communities in the city centre and caused a lot of displacement. And was the opposite of what you need to do to build a sustainable city. So I did a lot of research into the history of trans transport in the city in 2016 and have done since. This is a, a map from the 1940s, which shows the tram map, um, where a model for a sustainable city of the future, where you have a, a zero carbon a transport system 
built into very densely populated city that people can easily more easily walk and cycle around. Um, of course, there aren't many cars um, in those days. And all of that was ripped up in the 1960s and replaced by this, the M8 motorway and other motorways that go around the city. Um, and yeah, but this, this, this kind of car centric infrastructure has just served to exacerbate inequalities between people who can afford to own cars and can make the most of this infrastructure and can get around the city very easily and people who can't afford to own cars and therefore are completely dependent on public transport, which isn't fit for purpose at the moment. So just to finish off with a little bit um, of, of, of the activities that have kind of been involved in since 2016, really thinking about how I can, as an artist, uh, re like um, use the skills that I learned at art school and through my extensive education to try to affect positive social change on the city. So I'm very passionate about public transport, which I'm sure we'll come back to in the discussion. But I helped to set up a campaign called Get Class and Moving, which is campaigning for a world class fully integrated public transport system that will cover the whole region. So it doesn't matter where you live, you can get around easily without needing to own a car. We're campaigning to get our buses back into public ownership or to at least re regulate the buses so that we can cap the fares and plan the routes to meet community needs. And I've also been involved in setting up a campaign called Free Our City, which is campaigning for free public transport um, is arguably the only way that we're going to shift people onto public transport at the scale and speed that we need before 2030. Um, and the other thing that I've been doing in the book and through a few other bits of activity through an organisation called Car Free Guys Guys, is trying to um, inspire debate about, around alternatives to this carbon intensive motorway car centric infrastructure. So looking at examples from other towns and cities across the world where they have removed motorway infrastructure. The most famous one is Seoul in South Korea where they moved, removed, you can see the before and after in that in that photo, they removed this motorway and, and it had gone over this river when it was first built. So they reinstated the river. And the M8 motorway in Glasgow is built over the Monkland Canal. So in the book, I'm kind of advocating once we've got our world class public transport system up and running, then we need to think about removing the motorway and um, reinstating the Monkland Canal. And I have this picture in the book, which is I find very inspiring from um, Germany, the Ruhr region of Germany, where they closed a 60 kilometer section of motorway just for one day, but to hold the biggest straight party the world has ever seen. Um, and it, this during my year in Glasgow in 2016, I was thinking back to when I was a teenager in London reclaim the streets movement was just kicking off and I mean I wasn't organized I wasn't involved in organizing any of it because I was too young but I did go along to some of the events and I have this really formative memory of going to this flyover in Shepherd's Bush which everybody just stormed onto and closed the motorway and I threw a party and in the film about reclaim the streets there's a woman saying that even just doesn't matter if it's only temporary. Everybody who gets to experience it during that day gets a glimpse that another world is possible. And that's why I think it's such a, a powerful thing to do. So I think that's all of the slides I'm going to show. Um, so hopefully Natalie will come back in and keep me company. I am. I am going to keep you company. Thank you so much, Ellie, for sharing that. Um, there are, well, as you know, because we've had a lot of back and forth, but there are so many questions and points and facets to the project that um, I really want to pick up on. But um, I think we'll, maybe it feels right to start with 
the idea of the local. Um, and you mentioned Patrick Geddes's um, kind of imperative to think global and act local, which is it is a core theme and, and weaves its way through through the Glasgow effect. Um, I recently had the pleasure of listening to a presentation by artist and activist Owen Griffiths based in Swansea. And um, he was talking about his commitment to working locally, so within the town that he lives. And he described the phrase as digging where you stand, which I thought was a really beautiful metaphor and also hugely relevant to one of your key messages. Um, could you talk a little bit about this as your starting point for the project? Um, and also it feels, um, you know, with, with, with what we've been living through the past few years, you know, with this, the stay home mandate um, of the pandemic, which kind of inadvertently put us all in your shoes, you know, created the conditions of the Glasgow effect that you set yourself for all of us. Um, and I just wonder, um, do you think that this, the pandemic, um, do you think this altered kind of uh, thinking about and commitment to the local? And I also wondered kind of had, you know, do you think that this experience has shifted people's perceptions of the project retrospectively? If you could talk to, sorry, that's kind of two in one. <laughs> yeah, great questions. Um, I think, yeah, I think Global Act Local um, was actually the working title for the Glasgow Effect. Um, I mean, all of the whole story is just kind of explained in the book and it's a bit too much detail to go into now. Um, but I, when I wrote the funding application to Create Scotland, that's what I called the project, Think Global Act Local. Um, and it, it was, you know, a phrase that I'd, it's really, I wouldn't say it's overused, but it's not used a lot in in kind of um, in in the climate movement and and in I guess community activism. And it is something that I really believe in. And I have an illustration in the book from I think 2014 of a it's a an image of one of my notebook pages from around that time where I'd written Think Global at Local at the top of the page and then I had a list of all these things all these projects that I'd love to get started on in Glasgow if only I had the time if only I wasn't too busy like traveling around and doing this and doing this or going to work or whatever and um, this is what I thought I should I knew deep down that I should be investing my time in in Glasgow um, so that little list was called Think Global at Local. Um, but then I, I decided, as I described um, in, in my talk, to switch the title to the Glasgow Effect for all the region, reasons that I gave. Um, but yeah, I think the idea behind Patrick Geddes' phrase is that, and really, I think it's really kind of come into its own in light of, of, of the climate emergency that we're facing huge global issues um, that, but actually we shouldn't necessarily let them overwhelm us because the answers can be on our doorstep. Um, and that also we need to get our own house in order in a way uh, before, before we can even start thinking about going further afield. So that's why I've really kind of focused in on, on, on local activism. And I think that, yeah, definitely the pandemic gave me a sort of different perspective on the project. And I know that quite a few people read the book during lockdown and found it to be quite a, a useful thing to be reading during that time. Um, and like I showed in the slide, just in terms of the carbon impact of of being told that you're not allowed to travel, like it, it is, it is quite significant. Um, but in yeah, in the introduction, like the, the foreword to the second edition, which I wrote um, after the pandemic. Well, sorry, last November, ju just in the run up to COP, I was trying to look at some of the positive aspects of lockdowns and definitely kind of that intense refocusing on our local areas. 
and the flourishing of local activism because people couldn't travel and because they could see that people in their local areas needed help. Um, there were lots of mutual aid groups popping up all over the country. Um, there was a lot of people who moved in with elderly relatives, including myself. I wasn't actually in Glasgow for most of the lockdown because I, I went to look after my dad. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the reduction in emissions. So looking at those three positive aspects, um, outcomes of, of lockdown and and thinking, how can we how can we hold on to the best of those things like going forward? Um, and yeah, hopefully that is still possible. I mean, I think people's attitude to travel definitely has changed a bit. Um, but I love that phrase, digging where you stand. I think that's something that I'm going to look into a bit more because it kind of suggests that you don't really need to go anywhere. You can just dig deeper, <laughs> dig down where you are and discover what's really going on in your local community. And that's actually potentially a lot more rewarding. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, the, the scale of, um, what happened um, and the kind of the, the commitment you had to, 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 to the Glasgow effect is really staggering. And I think if, for those who haven't read um, the book, the amount, um, the amount of, as you say, outputs that came as part of the project is, is really, um, yeah, staggering. On your website, you have, um, you've listed a chronological list of these outputs, a kind of cross talks, events, debates, data. You know, you really didn't shy away from the kind of public nature of it and some of the contested ground. Sorry, I'm riffing a little bit here because um, so it's really worth kind of looking at the full scale of the kind of the, the project because um, yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of communicate, I think, yeah, the breadth and depth of it. And, and that's made me think a little bit about kind of content versus form as well, and how those things to connect. So I'm thinking, I think my question is, um, in terms of communicating your ideas and communicating your um, kind of some of the kind of messages or thinking around the project, what kind of formats, I'm interested in what kind of formats of the work do you think kind of best serve to kind of, yeah, to, to share what the Glasgow effect was all about, because there, there was so much that was going on as part of it. Well, I think a lot of it, it was hidden and still is hidden. Um, and yeah, a lot of it's still unfolding because a lot of the campaigns that I'm involved in, I got involved in, in 2016. Um, mm. I didn't also didn't mention um, the Glasgow Community Energy renewable energy co-op um, that uh, well I actually began working to develop that in 2015 but did a lot of work on it in 2016 and it's still going on and and get Glasgow moving and those projects um, you know that they're, they're they're ongoing things the whole point was that they're established that they have a sort of governance structure and that they can go on and grow and hopefully um, you know be around for as long as is necessary um, with or without my involvement and and um yeah so I think I mean the book I wasn't I didn't set out to write a book in 2016 like that wasn't my plan um but as I said it was really reading Darren's book and um obviously Darren had been a big critic of mine but it's not like we don't get on because we did meet up in 2016 and you know I really really like his work and I think he eventually came around to sort of understanding more about what I was trying to do um, but he inspired me to write a book um, and it's quite funny because his book starts with saying people like me don't read books like let alone write books um, but I, it, it never even occurred to me that I would write a book until I read his book. So hopefully my book will inspire more people to, to think that it's possible. Because when I, when I kind of look at it, it, it it's much longer than I, 
I expected it to be and the publishers wanted it to be <laughs> because uh, I think I only had a contract for 40 to 60,000 words and it ended up being 120 but I just I just had so much to say I was just like there is so much buzzing around in my head and I know it makes some sort of sense and I just have to get it all out like I have to get it all out and and it felt at that point that that was the best way to try and communicate the project um and I'm not planning to write another book either like it's that's it <laughs> like I, I I've often said like publishers worst nightmare because they want you to write a different book every year so they can keep blogging them <laughs> but I've just written this one but I've got nothing else to say really because it's all in the book mm -hmm. um but yeah the, the activity that came out of the, the Glasgow effect is ongoing and the thing that I'm really working on at the moment which maybe will feed into some of the stuff that you will talk about in a bit more detail in a minute is is these musicals about bus regulation <laughs> probably need to do a whole talk about just about these but it's um and basically because I, I just put on a musical about bus regulation in Glasgow bus regulation the musical Strathclyde um and that's the second in a trilogy of musicals and I know Car Caroline who's on the call um is based in Greater Manchester, and, and she was at the the um, the first musical that I did in the trilogy, which was in Greater Manchester in 2019. And I kind of was devising the musical as I was writing the book, and I was really thinking about it as a kind of response to the backlash that the that the Glasgow effect caused. That I wanted my own next artwork to be more of a well, it was a fusion of art and activism, but it was also a really kind of fun, family friendly thing that nobody could possibly take offense to, apart from the my my enemies, who are the bus company bosses. They're the only ones that I don't mind uh, pissing off now. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 this is the kind of epic <laughs> trilogy is it's kind of come out of the Glasgow effect and I kind of see it is feeding back into that research because the final part will be in Liverpool later this year. Um, I just found out that I've got funding from Arts Council England to do it, so I can definitely do it, so I'm very excited. And I've picked those three cities, and this is the, this is the symbol that I've devised for the trilogy, Glasgow, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, depending on which way you're looking at it. But those are the three cities that are used as comparators when measuring the Glasgow effect. So I'm kind of plowing my own very specific um, piece of research, looking at the relationship between public transport policy and population health. Mm. That's my own little niche. And the reason I picked those three cities is obviously Glasgow. I live here and I'm involved in the campaign here, but but, but Manchester and Liverpool, Manchester in 2021 um, made history by committing to be the first UK city region to re-regulate its bus network. So it's rolling that out at the moment. So that's really historic because the buses were deregulated in 1986 and have caused a huge amount of problems. And um, we've lost millions of miles of bus routes as a result of that decision. So Manchester are leading the way. Liverpool are working on the plan at the moment and they're likely to be the second city region to, to do that. Um, and Glasgow, unfortunately, despite all of our efforts we get Glasgow moving, is lagging behind. But the point is we're already lagging behind in Glasgow in terms of that measure of population health. So if we do not follow Manchester, Liverpool by sorting out our public transport network and delivering that to make sure it works for everybody in the city and is it affordable for people to get around, then we're just going to fall further and further behind. So I think the comparisons between the three cities are really useful, particularly around the public transport policy. So that the trilogy in the book, I see it all part of this thing that is going to be unfolding over the next couple of years as well. It's um so this 
um, it's kind of public transport, how it operates and who is it for, you know, who does it serve, you know, it's a key focus of the Glasgow effect and it relates it just for kind of broader context as well to the ongoing project, as, you, as I said in the introduction, um, bring back British Rail. Um, we can potentially pick that up a little bit, but I think I also just, mindful of time, I just want to um, say to, yeah, everyone, please, um, questions. Let's, let's take some questions. So feel free to um, raise your hand, pop your video on um, or put them in the chat, but I just certainly want everyone to be able to kind of feed in, so. Right. Caroline in Greater Manchester has uh, said that I forgot to mention that the musicals are inspired by Starlight Express and are performed on roller skates, which is quite important detail. <laughs> I'll put the link in the chat in case anybody wants. Oh, you've just put yourself on mute. Are you? Anybody for questions? Sorry. I can't see, has anybody got their hand raised or wants to just unmute and just let the question flow? Um, I can't see anything in the chat. Um, let me Sorry, yes. Ah! Oh, okay, I did. Hi, I did Paul. try to. Hello, thank you. I can't. I haven't got myself for you on. Sorry, I, I tried to put my hand up, but it failed. Um, no, it was just. It was just more of an observation, really. It was kind of. Um, I I find it a very. Just gonna say, I find it a very readable book. I'm I'm quite dyslexic, so I, and uh, I kind of re and I was kind of I was given it uh, by my partner, and I thought, oh, thank you very much. This is an enormously thick book. As a dyslexic, I thank you for this. Um, but then I kind of started reading it and I really, I, I, I just like the, the writing style of it. And it was, it's really interesting. I thought it was really interesting on a number of, of levels. It was really interesting now as a, as a parent of a child to kind of almost see, you know, kind of how, how that child is kind of growing up. I really love the kind of, uh, the kind of diary bits of it. And then it would kind of switch between the kind of quite diary bits to really quite kind of heavy kind of economic bits I thought that was really nice that kind of that flow that was kind of caught you slightly out you know it was kind of uh, slightly off guard but I didn't really have any questions as of such it was more of a, a kind of a bit of a, a thank you observation because it's a uh, you know as I said when it was handed to me I thought oh no this is this is you know because if someone gives me a book it's, it's like a three-year commitment so yeah. you know if it, <laughs> so so it's good yeah I'm, I'm still working my way through it but I, I enjoy it when, I, when I'm going that was that was it Thank you so much, Paul. That's so amazing to hear because, like, I, I, as I said, never thought I was going to write a book. Didn't know I'd be able to write a book, and but I just found that I just sat down and so much came out. So it was quite, large sections of it were written quite quickly, and I think that that has helped to get quite. You know, it's kind of like you, you're almost like you're writing it like you'd say it. So maybe it's easier for somebody to read. Um, but I also, because I was so inspired by Darren's book, I don't know if you've read Darren's book, it's a bit shorter than that's mine. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> but, that's, that's um, four years away, yeah. It's, uh, it's um, he, he has very short chapters, which makes it very digestible. Um, and my chapters are longer, but I kind of break them down into these sections. So I think the sections are, you can get through quite easily. And, and even if there's quite a dense section, <laughs> <laughs> that you hopefully are going to get on to a bit that's a bit lighter um yeah. a bit a bit later on but yeah I thought the personal narrative was important although I did feel very nervous about sharing that and very vulnerable but again I was really just inspired by Darren having done that and that seeing how important it was for understanding where he where he's coming from as well like to understand the experiences that he'd lived through. Um, and, and also because they're the best bits to read, right? <laughs> the juicy gossipy bits, right? They're the fun bits that keep you going. Thanks, Paul. Um, 
we have Cambridge Artworks, raise their hand. Hi, um, Edith, hi, Cleo. Hi. Um, I just wanted to kind of, sorry, I'm Cleo here, yeah. So I just wanted to um, kind of ask if you could, because I'm, I'm afraid I, I missed the beginning, so I might have missed something here, but the complex area around where play and kind of creativity and activism kind of crosses over into um, the political world and how you kind of decide at what point your, your role, um, so how you, how you pull back and forth within this um, self-definition really, as someone who's creating change in a city, do you ask yourself, well, should I become a councillor? Should I be sitting on the um, Glasgow City Council's transport committee? Um, you've set up an alternative, you know, you're setting up something that's alternative, but what is the relationship between something that's kind of, you set up on the margins and the aim to be in the centre and affecting change and that sort of desire to remain an artist? If you'd like to kind of explore that a bit, that'd be interesting. Wow, that's a great question. Um, and yes, I think in the book, I do talk quite a bit about my feeling about the relationship between art and activism and about seeing them as very kind of different, like sides of the spectrum really, um, of how you can affect change and, and obviously the activism being much more direct and the art being a little bit more removed and 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 um yeah a little bit a little bit more ambiguous I suppose um but yeah so get Glasgow moving it's it we do we are we're not affiliated with any political parties and I think that and the same with Bring Back British Rail, that those campaigns that I've set up have kind of deliberately not been affiliated with any political parties because we aim to influence all of the political parties um, and also to be represented as much as possible on things like council committees. Um, and yeah, but there is, I, I definitely haven't been tempted to be a councillor. <laughs> uh, but I have been tempted to try and become a board member at SPT, which is the Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, which is the body that's meant to be fighting for um, public transport. So I've applied for that, but I haven't been uh, selected. Um, I think I've got a bit of a reputation. I think people are a bit nervous of, uh, of, of me personally getting me involved. Um, I also, last year they were advertising for a new CEO of SPT. And uh, I thought I'd give that a go as well. So I put in an application for that. <laughs> but it wasn't successful. But I did hear that I made it onto the long list. And the main thing was to write out what my plan for public transport was so that they could at least read that on the recruitment committee. But again, they're a bit, bit too risk averse. So um, I think that, yeah, there is a bit, of a, a bit of a conflict there because I think one of the reasons I've got a reputation is because before Get Glasgow Moving was established, I was going to the SPT meetings in 2016, dressed in a t-shirt that, excuse my language, said fuck first buses on it, public ownership now. <laughs> so <laughs> I did have a bit of a, a, a rep, I did cause a bit of a stir because they had never previously, nobody had ever really gone to observe the meetings. Because I anyone could go as an observer, but I don't think anybody knew that that, that was possible. So um yeah I think they were quite flattered to have the attention but also quite terrified to have that sort of scrutiny <laughs> so yeah some of my tactics may have backfired slightly but but as I was moving you know it, it we've got a committee of activists and we represent a membership of around 200 people so we've got to with yeah be a bit more responsible in our tactics and obviously try to be um have a voice at the table whenever we can thanks 
Um, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I'm just trying to see if um, anybody else is raising their hand or popped anything in the chat. Uh, I can't see. Um, no. Um, Molly. Okay. I, oh, Molly has hand up. Molly. Molly does. Okay. Um, hi there. Hi. This is not um, really a a question, but more of a um, I don't know. I didn't expect to speak on this, so I'm a bit nervous. But um, I kind of came came at your book from Darren McGarvey's point of view. I started when I moved. I moved to Glasgow four years ago, and um, I I'm a teacher in the East End in Denston, actually. Um, a tiny, tiny little school that's in sort of on the edge of Deniston in the Hag Hill area. So it's quite a, um, can be quite a challenging environment to, to work in, especially because I'm from the, I'm from the Highlands and um, I come from a completely different, uh, uh, I grew up in a completely different environment and a completely different, um, uh, those class differences, obviously. So when I was reading when I, when I moved here and started to pick up on uh, Darren McGarvey's TV shows and his book, um, and he, he led me to your book, um, it was a real reassurance in a way, because I, you know, reading your personal journey with it as well, I, I saw I could relate a lot to your, your background, you know, coming from a, a mixture of uh, middle class, working class, um, but growing up middle class yourself and um, but and not really and finding it difficult to know how to um, help or you know do the right thing. Um, so I suppose it's just been you know and, and actually your book as Darren McGarvey's book led me to yours and yours has just sent me down this massive like um, wormhole of reading. Um, for like all your references and things which has kind of really really helped me to understand the Glasgow context understand the communities I'm working in and, and the issues they're facing um, and sort of develop a, a much closer um, well as Darren McGarvey puts it in his new book a much closer proximity where I feel like I as a, as a you know a middle class incomer um, I can actually you know, I can work, you know, work improving and, and, and situations there on a kind of ground level with, with young people I work with. So it's just to say, you know, thank you for um, kind of setting me on the right path with all that and, um, you know, helping me to better understand the, the city and, and how I can make positive changes here in a tiny little way in a tiny classroom. <laughs> but yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for speaking. That's it's fantastic to read. And I don't want to send you on a <laughs> I don't want to send you on a wormhole anymore. But I've done a bibliography. Have you seen the bibliography that I've done online? Um I'll put it in the chat. Anyway. No, I haven't. I haven't, but okay. I would be really interested because <laughs> I, I I'm always looking for more. Um it, there's it. a lot there's a lot on there uh, but that was one of the things that I kind of didn't have time to um to do before the book was published but I did it during well it wasn't yeah it was during the lockdown I think um I started it here we are um But I would really recommend the Glasgow Centre for Population Health Report if if you haven't um, read that, um, because it's yeah really interesting, and there's a link to it. Sorry, I'm just trying to put this in the chat. There's a link to it in the bibliography. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, well, thank Molly. You, Molly. Maybe I'll see you. Probably you're probably like two hundred meters down the road. Thanks to everybody who asked questions. Um, 
and thank you to Ellie. Um, I'm really mindful of time. Um, so in addition to just saying a huge amount of thanks to everybody, I also just want to use this opportunity to say, if you haven't read The Glasgow Effect, do. Um, and uh, this is available, Ellie, from your website direct, isn't it? I do have some of the old edition the old <laughs> on edition. special offer. If you want the green go. one, you can go the new one. Um, then you can go to the publisher's website, Lua Press. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay. Um, it's at this point where I just, yeah, find, just final, finally want to thank everybody. Um, to Ellie, um, it's, I keep thinking about the Glasgow effect. I keep writing down notes to myself and we had reams of questions to get through. So um, yeah, there's just so much more to kind of talk about and think about, but um, thank you for what you shared Ellie tonight. Thank you to everybody for coming. And um, please do keep an eye on Peer Project's website for updates on the next Studio Social. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening.